So, <coughs> again the start of a new lecture. So, we will just review the contents of last lecture briefly and then move on to the new lecture and this is the last lecture of this module. Um, after that we will have two or three smaller modules which we should finish in three or four lectures. So, we are just coming to the end of this course now. So, in the last lecture we discussed about, uh, so just let us say review. So, in the last lecture we talked about uh, uh, basically magnetic ferrites and as the name suggests itself, uh, uh, since the name is magnetic ferrite most of these are iron containing compounds um, and that comes from the magnetic property of iron. So, the first of these happens to be um, your spinel ferrites and these spinel ferrites we discussed were variety of these Fe 304, Ni Fe 204, uh, Zn Fe 204 etcetera and these were uh, uh, also classified as inverse or normal. So, depending upon how the cations distribute themselves in the octahedral and tetrahedral interstices of FCC lattice made by oxygen atoms, these would be called either normal or inverse ferrites. Uh, um, and based on the distribution of these ions in the in interstitial sites, you could you could work out what is the net magnetization. Um, and this magnetization essentially, if you take one site, let us say tetrahedral side up then octahedral would be down. You can take either of them up or down, but the point is they are opposite to each other and it is a net magnetic moment of each of these site and algebraic sum of those two determines what is the net magnetic moment of the material and as a result these materials happen to be quite uh, magnetic in nature. They have large magnetic moment and, uh, and uh, they are soft materials which means they have a uh, slim hysteresis loop. So, they are typically soft ferrites. And then we talked about uh, hexagonal ferrites. In the hexagonal ferrites, we were mainly interested in barium um, uh, ferrite, barium hexaferrite, which was which is based on you know um, in the on the on the on the name magnetoplumbite, and that's why it's called as m type ferrite as well. Now this is a hexagonal unit cell. Uh, you can talk of this material as if it's BaO dot um, x Fe two O three. And this uh, essentially uh, happens to be six essentially, and um, and this happens to have a mixing of FCC based and HCP based layers. And since FCC HCP packing is fairly similar, except that in FCC you have ABC ABC, in a HCP you have AB AB packing, so they they mix with each other quite well, and resulting in a structure which is hexagonal in nature. And this material also has a large magnetization as we discussed upon distribution based on the distribution of iron atoms this because the iron here is the magnetic ion. So, based on the distribution of these iron atoms uh, you get a net magnetization. Uh, this material is highly anisotropic and as a result it is called as hard uh, magnet. So, this is a hard magnet and then third case that we took was of garnets. And these garnets are basically based on mineral names, but they are, but they are uh, magnetic. Uh, iron containing garnets are magnet, magnetic in nature, and these could contain, you know, the the. So they are yttrium, or let's say not yttrium. So they are the compounds con, uh, containing uh, rare earths or lanthanides, iron and oxygen. So the general formula for them would be uh, Re um, three Fe five and O 12. You can again break them into two oxides. So, this is let us say R E 3. Uh, so, it is essentially um, R E 2 O 3 1.5 and then what you have F E 2 O 3 and then multiply by such a factor. So, that it becomes 5. So, it is 5 by 2. So, it is essentially you can see that it is <coughs> it is 7 and a half plus um, uh, 4 and a half that make up 12. So, this is what is um, essentially garnet is and garnet can be tu tuned 
uh, uh, quite well because you can use this rhenium uh, rare earth atom as either yttrium or terbium or you know gadolinium or neodymium or lanthanum and depending upon the magnetic strength of each of these ion you have a net magnetization of the material and which essentially is nothing but 5 minus 3 mu r into times mu b or you could write uh, 3 r 3 mu r minus 5. So, basically you take more of this. So, so, essentially depending upon the strength mu r which is the strength of magnetization or magnetic moment of these rare earth ions you get the net magnetic moment and this can this is of course tunable. And again these structures can be made in single crystal form they can be made in oriented form. So, as a result microstructural tuning of these materials is quite important in determining the properties of these materials and also the composition which determines both the magnetic moment as well as the Curie temperature or is the temperature of operation let us say. So, this is essentially the summary of what we discussed last time and what we will now take up is essentially one more thing that we uh, that that we sort of uh, uh, did not discuss last time was um, especially in the case of spinel ferrites. Now, in case of spinel structured ferrites let us say now, now the mag the formula let us say is M E F E 2 O 4 where M is some metal ion. Now, this metal ion you can make it look like as if it is a N I Z N F E 2 O 4. So, it is a mixture of nickel and zinc. Now, here you see that nickel is a magnetic ion, but zinc is not a magnetic ion it has a 0 magnetic moment, but by careful mixing of these two you can achieve magnetic moment which is actually higher than the parent compound. So, the distribution when you mix zinc in there the distribution happens to be F E 3 plus 1 minus let us say if delta is the level of non stoichiometry a level of mixing let us say then Z n delta and that is 2 plus and then F E 1 plus delta 3 plus and N I 2 plus uh, 1 minus delta and the way these ions have distributed themselves is because nickel. So, this is nothing but you can say N i F e 2 O 4 into Z n F e 2 dot Z n F e 2 O 4 and if you look at here this is 1 minus delta and this is delta. Now, this happens to be a normal spin inverse spinel and this happened to be a normal spinel. here the distribution would be N i F e dot F e O 4 and uh, so it would be uh, A B 2 essentially A B dot B O 4 and this would be Z n dot F e 2 O 4. So, here nickel and iron atoms go to A site which is the tetrahedral site and, uh, and uh, nickel and iron atom go to octahedral sites sorry and one of the iron atom goes to tetrahedral sites and here zinc goes to tetrahedral sites and both the iron atoms go to octahedral sites. So, when you mix them together you make sure that iron atoms going to tetrahedral site in nickel ferrite combined with the zinc atoms which go to tetrahedral sites. So, that is what you see here that iron and zinc combined with each other going to tetrahedral sites. and nickel and iron uh, combine with each other to go to octahedral sites. So, this is octahedral, this is tetrahedral and that is how you distribute these ions with respect to each other. Now, here the beauty is when you calculate now, now, now it is fairly straightforward to calculate the net magnetization you just have to calc you just have to use the values of iron, nickel and zinc and multiply them by 1 minus delta and delta and 1 plus delta wherever is applicable. Now, the, the beauty of this is that when you plot this magnetic moment versus percentage versus delta. Now, this magnetic moment versus delta. So, let us say if this end is nickel ferrite and if this end is zinc ferrite and this delta is the level of uh, doping or level of mixing and then what you see is that. So, this is uh, mu 
at 0 k. So, this goes through a maxima something like this and this maxima occurs at around roughly 0.4. So, it is around 0.4 you get a maxima in the magnetization and this is and after that then again it decreases and then of course, you go to Z and Fe 204 which where zinc has 0 magnetization all the magnetization comes because of Fe atoms. So, this is how it looks like uh, and it becomes 0 for you know Z and Fe 204. Okay. So, now <coughs> the, uh, the thing that we are going to discuss is uh, another thing about uh, garnets is that um, that garnets are compositionally tunable. So, as a result when you make a plot of the magnetic moment versus uh, versus temperature then you for for variety of materials for instance it changes the Curie temperature or the temperature window of operation it changes like this. So, for instance uh, if this is a if this is the window for yttrium uh, let us say this is the window for holonium and uh, this could be uh, sorry, sorry this could be window for erbium this could be window for holonium etcetera. So, gadolinium will give you a window like this. So, depending upon the element you put it is temperature window of operation during which the magnetization is more stable can be obtained. So, for instance if you take if you take a Y G D F E O compound which means yttrium and gallium substitute for each other. So, 3 F E 5 O 12 then uh, for certain concentrations. So, if you if you take for if you take for x is equal to 0 which is uh, um, your G D is equal to 0 then you get a window like this and magnetization temperature of about 280 degrees centigrade Curie temperature and if you go for for instance 0 0.3 and 0 0.4 you get something like this. So, depending upon the composition you get a temperature window of operation for these uh, garnets. So, this which is compositionally tunable also these garnets can be fabricated in various forms they can be formed in single crystal form. They can also be formed in uh, um, uh, tape form or orient or oriented ceramics and as a result of some magnetic anisotropy this changes the uh, magnetic properties of these ceramics. So, now what we will do is that uh, we will shift our attention now towards the um, uh, properties of these magnetic ferrites which affect their magnetic behavior. So, <coughs> we will now look at the properties of importance for ferrites. Okay. So, first is the case of let us say soft ferrites and soft ferrites are typically your uh, cubic spinel ferrites and here uh, they are used in applications like uh, uh, inductor cores or also called as port cores for uh, telecommunications. They are also used in low power transformers and high flux transformers and uh, um, you, you can also have tele television line output transformers um, and many applications you can use them for. If you want to go into detail about the applications you can go through the book of uh, electro ceramics as a reference reading by uh, Moulson and Herbert and this is Wiley publication. So, this is a excellent book for talking about variety of applications. So, this is a nice book as a reference reading. So, one of the properties of importance is uh, permeability. Hmm. 
mu mu r okay and this uh, this mu r is dependent upon things like composition composition is one of the important factors which in determines this and another is microstructure how the grains are what is the grain size what is the level of porosity etc which determines this and uh, it's not a very straightforward uh, to determine this but it depends upon various magnetic parameters as well so magnetic parameters such as your saturation magnetization ms and then uh, or let's say high ms low magnetic anisotropy and low magneto striction magneto striction is, is essentially the coupling of uh, magnetic and uh, elastic properties and which is low uh, in these materials so uh, so essentially this perme permeability de depends in a quite complex manner on high saturation magnetization low magnetic anisotropy and low magnetization uh, typically uh, the magnetic anisotropy falls off quite rapidly as the saturation magnetization uh, falls to a low value near the Curie temperature because as you know as you increase the temperature to Curie temperature the saturation magnetization decreases. So, as a result this magnetic, magnetic anisotropy decreases which is understandable because of thermal forces become becoming dominant and as a result you, you have a low permeability of these materials. Now, <coughs> in case of nickel zn ferrites this magnetic anisotropy is low and uh, uh, and this can be adjusted by basically it can be tu tunable by it is tunable by substituting small amounts of cobalt by cobalt substituting to nickel this cobalt is a very important element in tuning the composition of magnetic ferrites and here it's it can change the um, uh, it can change the anisotropy uh, behavior of these nickel ferrites by cobalt addition now <coughs> another thing which is important is the sintering atmosphere sintering atmosphere can affect your magnetostruction properties but it can also uh, microstructure uh, so so you can have effect of sintering now, sintering as you know is a densification process and this densification proce process the way you carry out what temperature, what atmosphere, what time this determines the densification of the ceramic and this densification essentially controls the microstructure. Microstructure will mean grain size, porosity. Um, grain size would mean grain boundary as well and the type of grain boundaries whether they are insulating whether they are conducting etcetera. So, essentially this makes a dominant contribution to your domain domain walls or dominant effect on the domain walls the way they move and and that is how you change this and this has a dominant effect on mu r. So, essentially uh, if you have if you have a grain if you have a microstructure which leads to pinning of domain walls then or if you have kind of porosity then this sort of reduces the uh, permeability of the material. I will show you uh, I will show you some of the effects of this. Um, so, for instance, <coughs> so if you look at for example, in some system uh, the variation of mu as a function of grain size the model system then it increases as you increases the gain, grain size from let us say 10 micron to something like 30 microns and this increase in permeability can be 2 to 3 times. So, this is the effect of grain size uh, and then you can also do it by you can also uh, study the ch effect of change of fractional porosity. So, Porosity also has a dominant effect, so <coughs> so it sort of uh, tends to reduce the uh, permeability of 
of, uh, of ferrite materials. So, both grain size and porosity are function of the way material is made and this has a profound effect on the uh, properties especially the permeability of ceramics. Uh, another thing uh, that is of importance is uh, the, the, uh, the loss factor. Loss factor is you know is, is nothing but uh, tan delta and this tan delta has contributions from various sources and the sources could be you know your hysteresis sources, it could be eddy current losses and it could be just the residual losses and this residual losses are not easy to quantify or identify, but they are typically associated with your domain wall resonance. and your ferrimagnetic resonance, because simply because permeability is a complex property. So, when you look at it as a function of frequency, you, you are going to have a resonance and this um, uh, and when typically in the in the high resistivity ferrites where hysteresis and eddy current losses are low, uh, residual losses can be uh, quite high and this can uh, lead to lot of problems and 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 and, and this is essentially being uh, related to domain wall motion. Okay. Now, in case of ferrites, which uh, uh, in case of ferrites, which operate at high amplitudes. And high amplitudes would mean uh, anything in the excess of 10 milli tesla or milli tes 10 milli tesla is uh, quite high amplitude of field and frequencies of the order of 15 to 100 10 to 100 kilohertz typical. Uh, now, here the power dissipation is mainly hysteresis uh, uh, and eddy currents. In, 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 in such application uh, these are the two main mechanisms of uh, power losses in case of ferrites. Uh, another parameter of importance for uh, ferrites soft materials is their electrical resistivity. So, electrical resistivity is something that you know uh, uh, it is uh, it depends upon type of material that you have and typically ferrites although have high resistivity as compared to metallic counterparts, uh, but it is still of important because this resistivity determines as we discussed earlier eddy current losses. And this could be quite significant if the resistivity is low. And typically, the room temperature resistivity for ferrites lies in the range somewhere from 10 to power minus 1 to 10 to power 6 ohm meter. So, this is quite a quite a quite a lot of variation in the resistivity, and this depends upon composition, microstructure, etc. And and this is an or this is many orders of magnitude higher than ferromagnetic alloys. So, in case of uh, in case of alloys rho would be anywhere between. Uh, so, it is typically lower than 10 to power minus 6 ohm uh, meter. So, you can see that uh, there is a difference of uh, at least a few order of magnitudes in the resistivity of these ferrites. So, the definitely they are more resistive as compared to alloys, but it's still um, the resistivity is um, uh, tunable by changing the composition. So, for instance, if you look at the data for uh, and nickel and nickel zinc ferrites. So, if you plot it as a function of temperature rho versus T, the rho versus T plot goes something like this. So, if you if you if you take this somewhere from 0 to 150 degree centigrade um, or 100 degree centigrade, this variation resistivity is of the order of uh, is about uh, 2 to 3 orders of my uh, let us say this would be somewhere around 10 to the power uh, 5 and this would be somewhere around 10 to the power 3 ohm meter. 
So, about 2 to 3 orders of magnitudes uh, change in the resistivity is observed when you change the temperature by about 100 degree centigrade. And the conductivity in these materials essentially if you remember module uh, 3 I think when we discussed conduction in ceramics. So, these materials typically so you have an I. So, let us say you talk about Fe 3 or 4. Okay. Now, Fe 3 or 4 of course, has Fe O dot Fe 2 O 3. So, you have Fe 2 plus ions and you have Fe 3 plus ions and here you have site fluctuation valence fluctuations and this valence fluctuation gives rise to hopping of electron. So, essentially conduction in these materials because you have mixed valence conduction, conduction is because of hopping of carriers and, and this is between the, the equivalent sites. So, for instance you can have you can have this fluctuation from Fe 3 plus to Fe 2 plus or back and forth you have similarly uh, nickel as well nickel can also uh, exist in Ni 2 plus and Ni 3 plus state you have manganese manganese 3 plus 2 manganese uh, 2 plus state. So, since all these d transition elements they are susceptible to their change in the oxidation states this carrier hopping becomes a major uh, problem in terms of increasing the conductivity of these materials. However, you can change uh, the conductivity of these materials by careful processing. So, pro processing parameters such as conductivity or resistivity. So, depending upon parameters like you know atmosphere, temperature, uh, all of these etcetera etcetera uh, they give rise to changes in the microstructure and composition of the material uh, which, which lead to essentially um, change in the conductivity of the material. So, essentially uh, <coughs> you can control if you, if you for instance if you if you if you use the atmosphere which allows the reduction of Fe 3 plus to Fe 2 plus or if you use the atmosphere which promotes the oxidation of Fe 2 plus to Fe 3 plus then you have uh, then you have uh, you can control the um, uh, resistivity of these materials. So, <coughs> um, so, for instance in case of nickel zinc ferrite so, let us say composition. Uh, so, nickel uh, Ni Zn Fe 2 uh, Fe 3 plus delta O 4 minus x. So, you have nickel zinc ferrite here iron is 2 plus delta which means iron can be little bit in the excess of deficiency which will affect the oxygen deficiency or excess because as you know that um, uh, if you change the composition of one cation you are going to change the oxygen stoichiometry as well. So, this is a non stoichiometric material and this goes uh, this shows a change in the uh, uh, resistivity of this material. So, when you plot the resistivity log of resistivity uh, ohm meter versus delta this iron value. So, it, it goes through several orders of magnitude change at around 0 and uh, so this goes to as high as 10 to power 8 and this could be as low as 10 to power 0 or 1. So, about 8 orders of magnitude change just by changing delta a little bit here and there. So, this could be delta about 0.4 this could be minus 0.4. So, you change the delta here here and there about this boundary and you have massive change in the conductivity of the material and this is essentially because of you have Fe 2 plus to Fe 3 plus conversion here and here you have Fe 3 plus to Fe 2 plus conversion here. So, here you have so, in this case it becomes uh, you know uh, your uh, P type and here it becomes N type and of course, oxygen vacancies also play an important role. So, here you give rise to what is called as hole and here you give rise to what is called as electron and they change the conductivity of these material. Um, of course, you have competing factors like uh, nickel uh, 2 plus 2 nickel 3 plus uh, 
and you have oxygen vacancy playing its, its role as well. So, combination of these effects give rise to a large change in the resistivity of this material and this is an important uh, uh, point to note for these uh, materials. Okay. Uh, you can also change the resistivity by addition of certain other atoms. So, uh, so rho can be tuned by addition of elements like like cobalt, and this cobalt is something which which maintains the iron in Fe three plus state. Um, because this Fe 2 plus um, plus C O 3 plus reaction gives rise to Fe 3 plus plus C O 2 plus. So, cobalt converts itself from C O 3 plus to 2 plus and maintains the Fe 3 plus Fe 3 plus and 3 plus state. So, basically any Fe 2 plus which was in the material will convert back to Fe 3 plus. Similarly, uh, presence of N i 3 plus is also discouraged because of cobalt. So, N i 3 plus plus C O 2 plus will be C O 3 plus plus N i 2 plus. So, uh, so this is so N i prefers in the presence of cobalt N i prefers to be in the state of 2 plus and in the and iron prefer iron uh, iron 3 plus state is preferred and these factors increase the resistivity of this material. Uh, likewise, the rate of cooling has has an important effect as well on resistivity. Uh, uh, and again, uh, uh, this is something which is uh, quite important because uh, rate of cooling, <coughs> um, uh, the way you cool the material, the way you process the material. Let us say you have a polycrystalline material of variety of grains so now this is your grain and these this is your grain boundary now if you cool your material in such a manner so that your now typically you know that grain boundary diffusion is faster. So, grain boundary diffusivity so d g v is higher than d g which is d g is grain. So, as a result the grain boundaries get oxygenated more. So, the way you cool them in the atmosphere the grain boundaries get oxygenated more. So, grain boundaries become insulating and the grains become semiconducting and this gives rise to uh, a, 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 a behavior in which you have different regions of grain being semiconducting and different regions of grain being insulating and this can be represented in the form of an electrical circuit which can be understood and then you can uh, study various electrical parameters. So, uh, uh, for instance, uh, hang on um, next slide. Okay. So, here uh, since the grain and grain boundaries are different you can treat them as if um, they are shunted capacitors connected in series Oops. just like we saw in dielectrics. So, this will have its own impedance, this will have its own impedance. So, when you, so you have a dependence of frequent uh, resistivity on frequency as well and when you plot the resistivity it goes to some sort of uh, uh, frequency dependence and also you can you can note down the similar effect in the form of um, when you plot tan delta as well tan delta as well as the relative permittivity so the permittivity uh, will let's say goes like this and tan delta will go like this so Uh, so, this can be basically modeled and uh, various contributions can be extracted by doing proper analysis of this uh, electrical circuit. Um, finally, uh, from the point of view of resistivity, uh, you can also do uh, you can also do addition of uh, compounds and this the addition of compounds essentially to promote essentially to alter the nature of 
to alter the nature of grain boundaries. And so, if you add amount compounds like calcium oxide and silica, these calcium oxide and silica preferentially deposit at the grain boundaries. And what they do is that the silicon and calcium substitution in the ferrite lattice leads to uh, in the regions which are in the vicinity of the grain boundary, this leads to uh, uh, regions in the vicinity of so in increases the insulation of the regions which are in the vicinity of the grain boundary. So, it increases the overall resistivity of the material. So, this is uh, uh, what essentially is about the properties of uh, soft ferrites which are of interest. Um, another property which could be of important is uh, permittivity. epsilon r. Now, typically uh, at around 1 gigahertz, the permittivity is about 10 for manganese zinc ferrites, but it can become very high if you go if you decrease the frequency to 1 kilohertz, this can reach of the values of 10 to the power 4 to 10 to the power 5 and these are very high values and this is essentially caused by this insulating grain boundaries in these materials. So, again the properties of uh, certain properties are frequency dependent, certain pro properties are impurity dependent, certain properties are, uh, are dependent upon the processing. So, it is a very complicated game. So, the, the, the processing of these materials plays an extremely important role, um, processing and compositional tuning of these materials plays an extremely important role to tailor the properties of these, material, these materials according to your applications. And now, <coughs> what we will do is that we will look at some of the key properties of uh, hard ferrites and in, in the context of hard ferrites, <coughs> so in the context of hard ferrites essentially when we talk about it is basically these are you know permanent magnetic materials. So, which means they need to have large coercivity. Um, so, coercivity of these materials they call they are called hard because coercivity is typically higher than 100 to 150 uh, kilo ampere per, uh, per meter and this is very high as compared to your soft counterparts and, and the uh, one of the most important use of permanent magnets they are also used in memories where you do not want the states to be reversed, you want the material to remain magnetized until you do something deliberately um, and for that you need to apply very large field of course and for, for these materials as we discussed earlier, they have a large uh, if you draw the B H curve, the area under the hysteresis is uh, very large and they are characterized by what is called as maximum energy product. So, basically B H max should be as high as possible. The important properties of these materials uh, the hard ferrites are uh, things like <coughs> uh, magnetic remanence, and magnetic remanence are is essentially uh, a property which is uh, again a very important property. So, you can say B R and this is again a function of parameters like processing, the composition etcetera of uh, these materials. Uh, magnetic remanence can of course, be changed by things like um, uh, so, uh, for uh, if you take barium hexaferrite. Now, if you take if you take this material to be iso now there are various forms you can make this ceramic. Now, this is magnetic and isotropic material ok magnetically anisotropic. So, uh, your C axis it, it has magnetization along C axis large magnetization along C axis. So, but however, if it is in ceramic form, then in the ceramic form it tends to be more isotropic because the grains are randomly oriented. So, as a result ceramic tends to be isotropic, but if you if you make make it in the form of uh, if you make it such a way so that oriented you get oriented grains 
so which leads to formation of oriented ceramics this gives rise to you know more an isotropic nature so you can have you know one scenario is like this you have grains like so you can have orientation of grains random and in the second case you can have grain structure like this and this can be achieved by uh, proper uh, uh, processing so for instance if you look if we plot the magnetic induction br versus h so for a for a uh, for a polycrystalline a behavior would something like this and for uh, oriented uh, barium hexafluoride would be like this and this would be at least two or three times change in the uh, in the in the properties and then of course another parameter is coercivity which is hc and this hc uh, um, essentially uh, hc theoretically or uh, if you make it really well then it could exceed even 1000 uh, kilo ampere per meter however for practical materials it's a, it's in the low values and uh, uh, and this coercivity is a function of a strong function of grain size so uh, when you when you plot it as a function of grain size so uh, So, this varies somewhere something like this and this achieves a, achieves a maxima near um, about 1 to 2 micron and this gives you values of the order of 150 kilo ampere per meter 130 to 150 uh, and the, the reason it shows a maxima is because there is a close interaction of the domain size with the grain size. So, uh, the competition between do domain size the domain size con domain contributions and the grain contributions they reach a maxima at around 1 to 2 microns particle size in the in these materials and uh, so these are the some of the important properties of uh, soft ferrite hard ferrite materials um, i'll i'll list some of the properties uh, in a table so for instance if you look at now soft materials first so let us say we we take example of uh, uh, manganese zinc ferrite and uh, we take nickel zinc ferrite and we compare this with uh, something like you know fe silicon 4 percent silicon alloy and uh, so for for such materials the the permeability of these materials is of importance. So, for uh, manganese zinc ferrite it could be anywhere between 500 to 10,000. For nickel zinc it could be anywhere between you know uh, 20 to uh, 2000 or 50 to 2000 and for iron uh, silicon it could be somewhere around 1500 to 2000. And uh, uh, the value of H C which is in ampere per meter uh, it could be for iron silicon roughly about 30 25 30 for nickel zinc it could be anywhere between uh, sorry iron silicon would be about 30 40 here and manganese zinc could be anywhere be anywhere below 100 and uh, and for nickel zinc it would be it is rather higher. So, it would be somewhere like 25 to you know 1500. Uh, these are not sacrosanct values, but somewhere around these and this is close uh, function of you know doping and processing and etcetera. And if you look at the uh, uh, t, uh, the B s value which is in Tesla B s value for uh, iron um, manganese zinc ferrite would be somewhere around 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 for manganese zinc it would be somewhere around 0 0.2 to 0 0.4 and for iron 4 percent silicon it would be around 1.9 to 2 and T c of these temperature in degree centigrade uh, would be an 
it is less than 280 degree centigrade for manganese zinc ferrite, less than 500 degree centigrade for nickel zinc ferrite and around 690 degree centigrade for iron silicon and these TCs will again depend upon the temperature and uh, sorry composition and uh, of these materials. So, this is about soft magnetic materials. If we talk about hard magnetic materials, uh, basically ceramics essentially and then we talk about uh, you know uh, barium ferrite typically uh, barium ferrite. So, in first case we take isotropic and we then we take anisotropic and compare with something like you know carbon steel. Okay. So, isotropic uh, the, the values we can compare are of the H C which is ampere per meter, B S which is in Tesla and T C which is in degree centigrade. So, we are talking of the parameters which are of interest to these materials. So, isotropic barium ferrite shows a H C of about uh, um, 200 approximately B S of roughly 0 0.3 and T C of about 450. Uh, anisotropic shows value of about 320 and this is about 0 0.4 to 0 0.5 and this would be a roughly this would be 450 similar and carbon steel you will have about 1.6 very low uh, sorry about 4 to hang on 4 to 5. So, 4 to 5 and this would be a roughly 1 1 and this would be 770. So, you can compare the properties of uh, hard magnetic ceramics like barium ferrite with respect to something uh, a ferromagnetic alloy which is carbon steel. Uh, you can also look at some uh, neodymium based magnets like N D iron and boron these are also permanent magnets. So, here the values are 58 to 60 and this would be about 1.3 to 1.4 and this would be about 160. So, this is a comparison between these properties, but you can see that these properties are significantly different from what you got for uh, soft magnetic materials. And the applications of these materials, uh, they are used in variety of applications. So, I will I'll not go through the details of the applications, rather I will just list the applications which you can uh, uh, go through and uh, in any standard book. So, the applications of these magnetic ceramics now they are used in uh, as I said um, they are used in uh, your uh, as inductors uh, cores in transformers etcetera and electromagnets and uh, here basically you use soft um, basically you use soft ferrites like nickel zinc and manganese zinc ferrites and uh, the frequency ranges are about 100 to 100 kilohertz to 100 megahertz these are the frequency ranges and essentially they have high electrical resistivity which results in low eddicant losses and uh, they are and they are also used in you know power transformers etcetera. Um, they are also used for electric equipment shielding and uh, this is essentially because of their high impedance at high frequency currents. So, these uh, these basically prevent the high frequency uh, shield the high to shield high frequency noise. Uh, another application which is uh, important for these is data storage and in case of data storage essentially you have uh, you use gamma iron oxide. So, you use the elongated particles of these ga gamma iron oxide in a non magnetic binder and basically it is like a composite alloy and they have these essentially the size is such that so that this each particle acts as a single domain 
and the single domain has their uh, major axis in the plane of the tape. So, this shows quite large magnetization and coarser field in this uh, form can be as high as about 100 to 200 kilo ampere per meter. So, used uh, so gamma iron oxide with a binder in uh, in in the in the in the magnetic discs magnetic tapes essentially okay and last but not the least another application which is you which is uh, uh, important for these materials they are used as absorbing materials so you can say radar absorbing materials so, they can be used as coatings or uh, on top of uh, equipments to use the to absorb the radar signal and, uh, and they are also used for microwave applications because of their usefulness in the frequency range from 1 to 300 gigahertz which is a few centimeter to a, a meter. Uh, so, and here you use things like magnesium ferrites and garnets etcetera, lithium doped ferrites for these applications. So, this is where we close this module. Uh, so, in this module what we learnt is essentially the basics of magnetism. We looked at the uh, atomic uh, level of um, uh, reasons for magnetism which essentially arises from your orbital and spring magnetic moment ignoring the nuclear magnetic moment and the sum of these two is responsible for the overall magnetism in the material. There are four kinds of various magnetisms. You have diamagnetism, which is essentially because of negative magnetization, uh, because of uh, um, uh, Faraday's law, and uh, uh, essentially the the magnetization induced or magnetic moment induced is opposes the applied field. And this is an effect which is present in all the materials. So essentially, all the materials are diamagnetic. It's just that paramagnetic, ferromagnetic, ferry, and antiferromagnetic have extra additions which overshadow the diamagnetic additions. So, for diamagnetic materials you have susceptibility which is negative for purely diamagnetic, but for other materials susceptibility is positive and depending upon the magnitude of susceptibility you define them in the category of paramagnet, ferromagnet, ferrimagnet, antiferromagnet. And then even in these you have different uh, categories paramagnetic materials are materials where you have atoms with permanent mag uh, magnetic moment which are randomly oriented with respect to each other because of thermal uh, uh, forces. However, in the ferromagnetic materials and ferrimagnetic mat ferromagnetic, ferrom ferrimagnetic, antiferromagnetic, you have a spontaneous alignment of spins uh, in the regions called as domains with respect to each other. The parallel alignment because of exchange interaction gives rise to ferromagnetism and anti parallel alignment gives rise to antifero or ferrimagnetism. Um, and from the application point of view, what is important is the ferromagnetic and ferrimagnetic materials because they have remnant magnetization and coercivity and depending upon the area of this B H curve or M H curve you can define them into uh, uh, you can define them into soft and uh, hard materials and then we discuss the vari various properties which are of interest in, in variety of applications. The important thing to remember uh, the important thing which differentiates these different materials and different effects is the susceptibility and magnetization and the way they vary with temperature. In case of paramagnetic materials you have a Curie like behavior. So, it, it decreases in diamagnetic materials of course, you do not have a temperature dependence. In paramagnetic material the susceptibility essentially decreases to 0 at temperature T c which is Curie temperature. In ferromagnets the magnetization drops to 0 at, uh, at, at T c and susceptibility also drops to 0 at T c. But uh, uh, inverse susceptibility drops to TC, uh, temperature T c, but uh, uh, the, the behavior is slightly different near T c because you have this uh, Curie wise law coming to picture. So, you have slight deviation of magnetization at T c and then it slowly dies off to at theta and then you of course, have antiferromagnetic materials which have needle transition and, and above needle transition they are paramagnetic, below needle transition they are antiferromagnetic. So, this is sort of summary of this module. Um, uh, this this will be uh, um, so I have subscribed some books for you. Uh, you can read uh, books by uh, so uh, principles of 
electronic ceramics by Hench and West and then electro ceramics by Moulson and Herbert. Both are Wiley publications. So, these two books will provide a good overview, will provide you a good overview about the fundamental understanding and the applications of these magnetic ceramics. So, this module stops here. In the next module, we will start our discussion on some exotic kind of materials, electrocinamics, which are superconducting materials as well as uh, followed by um, multiferroic and magnetoelectric materials. And then finally, we will look at how these materials can be made. So, that is the end of this module. Thank you.